God bless you guys. It's so good to be here in the house of the Lord. Amen? Yeah. Wherever the Lord is, it's his house, right? Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in the cosmos, in the universe, and all that he has created, God is there. He's present. So um, it's just nice that we can be connected in spirit, even though, uh, like people who are watching online this morning, we're connected with you in spirit right we're one in the spirit so praise the lord and that's what our message is going to be to, about today about uh, unity about oneness avoiding schisms and divisions and stuff like that so father um we just want to thank you for this morning that we can come together to praise you and to worship you so we're here to give you thanks this morning, Lord, to lift our voices and our hearts to you. Father, may you remind us and make us aware of anything that may be on our heart that is not of you, that would hinder us, Lord, from receiving from you this morning or uh, hindering us from worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Father, may we repent of that right now. May we ask forgiveness. Turn from that, Lord, and turn towards you, that we can have the joy of the Lord this morning in worshiping you for your praise and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, why don't we all stand and we'll worship the Lord, amen?
Be 
Because of what 
you do for us and that you have done for us Lord and help us to surrender our lives fully to you God and not hold anything back because God you are worthy and you are strong and you are mighty Lord and we trust you because you've never let us down and you never will so God we just give you our lives, we give you our hearts and our minds, we give you our attention. And Lord, we just pray that you uh, just help us in our everyday walk with you, because we know that we can do nothing on our own. And we just thank you for your love and that you uphold us and keep us upright, Lord, and you walk us through life. You don't leave us alone. Lord, we just desire to be in your presence 24-7, never leaving, because there's no place to be other than with you, Lord. For in your presence, there's peace and there's rest. And there's true love. So, Lord, help us to desire you and no one else, and nothing else. Go before your word now, and uh, we just pray that you be with Pastor Dickey, and give him the words to speak this morning. Be with us, and open our hearts, our ears, and our minds to truly receive what you have for us. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So go ahead and greet one another.
plan to pray and fast the week of April 29th through May 3rd for various subject matters. Thursday, May 2nd is the National Day of Prayer. A handout will be provided next Sunday in your bulletin to guide us in what we can pray for during the week. Um, and also next week, we'll also have this in our flyer as well, in our announcements. Um, men's breakfast. Our next men's breakfast will be Saturday, May 4th here at church. If you plan on attending, please see Gus to sign up. There is a cost of $15 per person. Worship and testimony night. On Sunday, May 26th at 6 p.m., we will be gathering for a worship testimony and prayer night. It is always a blessing to come together and fellowship with each other in the spirit. Pace ministry. The Pace ministry, supported by OBCC, led by Janie Reyes, is now available to all. See Janie if you have any questions. Church campout. Mark your calendar for our church campout at Rancho Hurupa Regional, Regional Park. Scheduled for the weekend of August 23rd through 25th. You can see Renee and Terry Romero for information on how to reserve a site. The earlier, the better. Missionary updates. Please read the most recent newsletters from the missionaries we support. Post it on the bulletin board in the back. Now I hand it over to Pastor Dickey. Yeah, we just got a newsletter from uh, update from Amanda. Um, she's in the country. She's on the East Coast, but she'll be here uh, with us sometime in the summer as she'll be um, updating and communicating when she'll be coming. And then the R family um, sent an update as well. So those are back both on the, the bulletin board. And the R family normally will come uh, in the summer as well. And we also have... Uh, the other, our family, the Reyes family, who are in the Middle East as well, they'll be coming as well. They've already contacted me. They want to come and share with the church. So um, that'll be exciting uh, to have the three of them uh, come during the summer and share with us. So um, just, uh, you know, God had put on my heart some time ago, didn't know anything about it, about missions and, and how to deal with it, how to do it. And uh, the Lord uh, sent uh, some people and to the church and we were able to do that but it always had been uh, my heart to do that and um, and really the, the the blessing is is that um, these people that we support we know them personally and so um, we can have relationships with them so that's the blessing that's the awesome blessing that we can have so anyway so and uh, by the way just for the uh, the uh, prayer and, and fast week um, in your bulletin, it says we were going to put them out next week, the insert, but I went ahead and did it this morning. I was thinking like, well, what if people don't show up next week and they want to the insert, so we'll have them next week as well for you. So in case you'd lose your bulletin, you guys don't lose your bulletin, right? And put them in. Um, a lot of, a lot of churches don't do bulletins anymore, but, uh, but we do. We're, we're old school here in a way. Yeah. Uh, give me a knee bulletin. What is that? I don't know what that is. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We started 1 Corinthians last week. And we only got through an introduction in the first three verses. Um, and we're going to be covering verse 4 through 17 this morning. So pray with me. Father, we thank you. Lord, once again, that we can uh, come this morning, the privilege of coming together this morning in your presence. And we do pray, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us in your truth, um, drawing us closer to you, God. Uh, you know, when I think of the words of the disciples when they asked you, Lord, increase our faith. Um, Father, how wonderful, how wonderful that you increase our faith and Help us to do that by revealing more of yourself to us that, that we would never deny you and only look forward to having more of you in our lives. Uh, so, Father, we give you thanks and we give you praise, Father, for all that you're going to do. And we do lift up those who are in need of healing touch, those uh, who need to be comforted in times of loss, Lord. Um, Father, you know who they are. We ask that you would be with them. Uh, comforting them and bringing 
their needs to them, Father. And we know that you are faithful to do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, oftentimes I will uh, share uh, um, a church down here on my way home and on their marquee, the different things they have. And they had one uh, this week, which was kind of interesting. I think it was leading up to um, the message that was going to be given there this morning. And um, if you've seen it, you kind of wonder, like, what are they saying? What are they thinking? But, you know, it really spoke to me personally because it said, a plastic Jesus, real faith in a synthetic world. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. I, you know, I, I don't know where they're going with that message, but what really, what really hit me is that do I worship a real Jesus, right? I mean, I, I'm not saying I don't, but, but do we worship him truly with all our heart, that it's a real faith, you know? And, and not, not just the Jesus that we read about on the pages of the Bible or, or we might see a, a, a Jim Gaviso movie or, you know, th- that we look at those things. But Jesus is someone who is personal in our hearts and, and who is calling on us always to give him more of ourselves, to die to self. And we need to do that continuously. Amen? We need to do that continuously. And, and Paul, is, Paul is asking, pleading, exhorting the church at Corinth to do this very thing, to draw closer to God, to uh, die to self, and to give to God uh, uh, as God desires um, that there would be unity within the church. So, Let's begin here in, well, I'm going to start back at verse 1, and we'll read to verse 9, just so it has the good flow in it, and then we'll go over verse 4 through 9, and then we'll cover the rest in a bit. Um, and, I, and I want you to pick up on something. Let's see if you notice something within these verses and what's repeated often, okay? Uh, verse 1, Paul, called to be an apostle, of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you For the grace of God, which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as a testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So in, in those nine verses, what did you recognize that was repeated often? Jesus Christ, right? That's Paul's focus. Paul's focus is Jesus, especially when he begins to address the issue at hand. But before he addresses the issue at hand, I think it's important for us to notice the work that God has done in the Corinthian church. And Paul notes that and and reminds them of that so that they're aware of who's doing the work in their heart, in their lives. And that as they acknowledge God working in their lives, that they're going to live out their lives according to how God wants them to live it and not how we want to live it, right? Um, That's what it's all about. It's not about, Lord, I'm I'm sorry, I'm going back to one of the marquee (laughs) things there. Uh, Bless, O Lord, this day and how I choose to live. I'm like, no, that doesn't make sense at all. No, we, we don't. It's not how we choose to live, not I, not me but it's how God wants us to live. Amen? Would you agree with that? 
That's how God wants us to live. And that's the whole idea of Jesus reminding the disciples that there's a need for everyone, for all of them and every one of us, all who come to faith in Christ Jesus, to die to self. Die to self and live for Christ. As Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Amen? And, and so Paul, Paul really wants to make sure that he lets the church, he reminds the church what God has done in their lives. And so he, he starts here in verse 4, and he says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. So Paul immediately reminds them that, that, that the work that God has begun in you, it's not because of you, but it's because of God. And I thank God for that. I thank him always when I think of you. You know, he's writing this letter to them from Ephesus after he found out that there were some issues going on in the church. But before, before Paul addresses the issues, he's going to remind them of who they are in Christ and what God has given them and what that means for them. So he says, I, I, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God. Now, I, I want you to be reminded that, that Paul knew this church. Uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 11 tells us that, that Paul was at the church at Corinth for 18 months, a year and a half. Um, along with Ephesus, he probably spent more time with those two churches than any other church. Uh, in Corinth, 18 months. In Ephesus, two years, maybe a little bit more than that. Paul knew the Corinthian church. He knew the heartbeat of that church. He, he founded that church in his second missionary journey. And, and so he knows them very well. And so he can thank God always concerning them for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. Notice again, he, he says, that, I thank God for that, but it's because of Christ Jesus and what he's done. And of course, it's all in perspective when we look at it, it's all because of what he did through the work on the cross, his death and his resurrection that brought salvation. And along with salvation, the Holy Spirit that fills us and begins to do that work in us. And so uh, it, it is the grace of God. And, and it's the grace of God that has gifted them, as we will see here, which was given to you by Jesus Christ. Verse 5, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge. So the grace of God, the gift of God, and I would say that, the gift of God, the grace of God that enabled them once they, they came to faith in Christ, now to do the work of God. We don't do that on our own, right? I, I know when I came to Christ, and more than likely when you came to Christ, uh, we understood our need for a Savior, that we're sinners and in need of a Savior to save us from, from going to hell, from spending eternity in, in eternal damnation, right? And, and so we, we come to salvation, but what happens after that? You know, what, what do we know past that? Well, God begins to do the work through the Holy Spirit because now the Holy Spirit draws us to his word, um, draws us to the things of the Spirit, and then we begin to grow spiritually um, as we understand the word of God, the knowledge of the word, the understanding of the word, and then, as Paul will point out, in chapter 2, he, he then begins to talk about spiritual wisdom as we're going through on Wednesday in Proverbs. And so, so this is the work of Christ Jesus in us. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. And notice he says, you were enriched in everything. The idea that they were enriched has the idea that they were fully furnished, right? Now, I know when we moved into our house, that house was empty. But we had to soon furnish that house to make it really be a home, right? Well, it's kind of the same idea in that, you know, when we come to Christ, yes, we, we have Christ in our heart through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. 
but, but there's more that God wants to do and more he's going to furnish us with. And he does this. He says, you were enriched in everything by him. And, and he starts out with all utterance and all knowledge. Now, when you think about all utterance, it means their, their manner of speech, the way they spoke. Um, when, when I think about that, I was thinking into it or, or just praying into this, like, Lord, okay, in all utterance, in all knowledge, what, what do you mean by that? Well, you got to tie in verse 6 because even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, and, and I, I know my speech changed, right? Did your speech change once you came to know the Lord? You could talk about Jesus in a, in a very spiritual way, in a way that was meaningful to you. Um, man, just the verse that comes up that I just absolutely love, that it's not about arguing uh, about Christ or anything like that, but it, it's in 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, where he says, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart. It's verse 15 of 1 Peter 3. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. Now, that's, that's the divine speech. That's the utterance that the church was given, where, where they could talk freely and openly and, and spiritually correctly about the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that, that it, was, it was now a different style that they were speaking. They weren't speaking the world's language. They were now speaking the spiritual language, the godly language, um, because it changes, right? We get away from that worldly language and we start speaking the heavenly language in that sense, the godly language, the divine language that God has furnished us with in this sense. And just be reminded, another one of my favorite verses, don't you just love that the Bible is filled of all your favorite verses? Yeah, it's pretty awesome. But in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19 through 20, in Paul's prayer, uh, a, a second prayer for the church at Ephesus here. He, he's praying and he says to them to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled, notice this, that you may be filled with what? All the fullness of God. Isn't that awesome? God's desire again is to richly furnish us that we would be filled with all the fullness of God, the idea of all the fullness of God is that nothing would be left out, right? Nothing would be left out. But now, the thing is, is, is do we want that? Do we want it all? Because if we want it all, again, it comes back to denying ourselves and, and allowing God to have it all. Amen? It's about that. Just dying to self. And he goes on in verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. See? Folks, I mean, there is power. It's, it's God's power. It's Holy Spirit power that works in us. Um, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Whatever, and, and this is the point that Paul's making with the Corinthians. He says, whatever God has done in your life, what he has done in your life is not for you, but it's for God's glory. Now, I'm reminded of Revelation 4.11 in the King James Version. It says that all things were, have been created for his glory, for his purpose. See, we weren't created for our glory. And this is what the Corinthian church began to do. They were... They were now looking at themselves and really patting themselves on the back and, and, and building themselves up. But he reminds them, hey, remember where you came from. And I, I love that because God always wants us to remember where we came from, what he's been doing in our lives. And, and guess what? He's never done, right? He's never done. 
being confident in this very thing that he who has begun a work in you will be what? Faithful to complete it until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's never going to be done until the Lord, we're before the Lord or he comes for us or we're before the Lord, whatever the case is. As long as we're here on this earth, God is consistently working through us. And, and I think Paul also reminds them of the work that God is doing in them or has done in them and what he's doing in them, that they would re be remembered of, reminded of that, remember it, and that they would continue in the power of God and not in their own power or their own strength. But again, they were richly furnished with the speech, how to speak of Christ. Um, having that knowledge, and, and notice again concerning their testimony of Jesus Christ. He says, even as it is confirmed in you. Um, it was evident. It was evident. You, you can see it in them. Uh, verse 7, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, so they were a church that was spiritually blessed with supernatural gifts, right? Paul, Paul will address those things in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the spiritual gifts chapter. He'll address them. Uh, he'll address them because they were abusing the gifts. They were not allowing the Spirit to move properly in their lives, and they began to take it into their own hands and do it their own way. Um, we, we have to be careful of that, all right? We have to be careful of that. Let's not get too much confidence in ourselves that we're not allowing our confidence to be in Christ and the power of God. Amen? Because remember, we're, we're flesh, and we could be prone to do that. We could be prone to lift ourselves up, right? I mean, that's the whole idea of, of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it, it, for it is by grace that we're saved, by faith, not of works, lest we would boast, right? Oh, man, we would boast. If it was based on our works, I can see a heavenly scene of, of us in, there in heaven based on our works, and, and one of you might be saying, well, I'm here because I did this. And another would say, well, <laughs> that's nothing. I'm here because I did this. And we're always upping one another. That's what it would be like. And he says, lest you would boast. But it is by grace. And, and Paul's saying it's not because of you. It's not because of what you've done. It's because of what God has done in you as we were singing that song. Um, and, and that they would come short in no gift. See, the, the gifts were given for a purpose. And the purpose was to fulfill God's will and his purpose. Okay? And, and Paul will get to that um, in, in the end of this section here. Well, actually, into uh, verse 10, he'll, he'll say that. He'll remind them of that. But as they were even blessed with the spiritual gifts, Notice they were eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so, you know, even what Jesus said, he said, hey, look, you know, the idea of occupy till I come. Keep, keep working till I come, but, but keep your eyes looking up. Keep looking up because Jesus is coming back, right? Jesus is coming back. I mean, in John chapter 14, he says, I go and prepare a place for you, and if or not so, I would not have told you. But where I am, there you will be also. Because he's coming back. He's coming back. But he prepared that place for us um, in his death and in his resurrection. And so they eagerly waited for the revelation of Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, let me, let me just say that... Um, it's an important teaching, doctrinal teaching, that we never forget the return of Jesus Christ. He's coming back, folks. And we have to, we have to live 
with that in mind, but not in the sense that, and Paul lets us know here, they were, they were gifted, they were to be busy with the, the thought in mind that Jesus was coming back. I think sometimes we may fall into a place where we say, well, Jesus is coming back, so I could put it on cruise control, you know, because he's coming back anyway, and he's going to take care of things, so everything's going to be made right in Christ Jesus. No, God, God wants us to stay busy about his business with the idea of him coming back, amen, with the idea of him coming back. And so they, they were a church that was looking to Jesus in this way. Now, verse 8, it says, um, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So while they're doing the work of God, while they're waiting for the work of God, they're waiting for the return of Jesus, um, notice he will confirm you to the end. The idea of confirm is not to acknowledge, but more it's the word, that talks about establishing you, um, setting you firm, all right? It's Christ who will establish us. Yes, he's going to acknowledge us, but he's going to acknowledge us in a way that he's going to establish us until the day that we are with him. And notice this, that we would be blameless. Again, blameless because of the work that, that he has done in us not because of what we have done, all right? Think about it. We're going to be blameless. And why will we be blameless? Because he already took it upon himself. He took our sin, the wrath upon that sin, at the cross where we would not have to experience that wrath and so that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I, I think by this time, as they're reading this, as they're acknowledging that, and I hope we get the same thing, we, man, just how much Christ has done for us. Amen? How much he has done for us. And the idea of, of our position in Christ. Folks, look, every one of us is important to Jesus. Just know that. You are precious. You are precious in the sight. Of Jesus Christ and you know I think there's a commercial that and I will fight for you well Jesus will fight for us he's already fought for us at the cross and he will continue to fight for us the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives just blessing us and being with us it's all about him and then in verse 9 Paul also said God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So yes, God is faithful. God is faithful to accomplish everything, to keep us going in this world, right? To keep us going in this world. And Paul reminds him of this. So in these first nine verses, yeah, Jesus Christ is mentioned Nine times. And then again in verse 10, he mentions Jesus Christ again. Notice here in verse 10. Now I plead you, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So now Paul begins to address the first issue at hand. I, I think it's the most important issue. Yeah, there's going to be other things that they were uh, having fault with, but, but I think this is the, the most important issue because what was beginning to transpire within the church was now there were divisions among them. Um, the church had not split yet. There was no split in the church. 
but there were divisions. And I, I just quickly want us to note, okay, and, and observe here, that as Paul points out, with their contentions among them, and each of them saying, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. You notice the I there? Who's the focus? It, the focus is, is me, I. And, and I'm the one making the decision what's most important for me. Now, I know you're, you would look into this and go like, well, those guys that followed Paul and Apollos and Cephas were all wrong. Those guys who follow Christ, they're the ones who are right. Well, let's think about that for a while before we get to it. And, and were they right? Were they correct? In one way, yes, but in, in much more, they weren't. Uh, but, but Paul starts out in verse 10 and saying, like, now I, I plead with you. Now, the idea of pleading is, is like, I beg of you, I urge you. But it's also in the sense that Paul is giving them an exhortation. I exhort you. I, I think it's important for you to acknowledge this and then receive it. I, I exhort you. Brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. Okay? So Paul addresses that head on. Now, again, keep in mind he reminded them of their position in Christ and what Christ has done for them. And since Paul had left them, they were left in good care. Paul always left the church in good care. He, he made sure that there were good leadership in place and everything and left it in good care, and then he would leave. And so the leadership was probably at fault as well here. But Paul addresses them, and notice the authority that he lays it down with. I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the tenth time in ten verses that he's mentioned Jesus Christ. He's definitely reminding them of who the authority is. Although he does come strongly with his apostolic authority. He, he laid that out in verse 1. But... Paul is saying, but the ultimate authority, the preeminence here, is Jesus Christ. And him is who we follow. And I think he's establishing this because there are those who say, I am of Paul. <laughs> and Paul's going like, uh, I'm, I'm, I submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't want to say like Paul was saying, I'm like nothing, I'm a nobody. No, Paul was somebody in Christ. He knew his position in Christ. Um, so I don't want us to get the idea that Paul was saying, like, I'm a nobody, I'm a nobody. No, Paul knew his position in Christ. He knew he was somebody in Christ, right? I always remember that. You are someone in Christ. You are very important. You are established in Christ, okay? And we know that without Christ, we can do nothing, right? But we're established in Christ, now, it doesn't mean that we could beat our chest and go, yeah, I'm establishing Christ. No, we're, we, we, are, we receive it in the way that we're established in Christ because of what he's done and what he's doing and to give him the glory and the praise. That's, that's the only thing. But as we're establishing Christ, again, he puts the focus on Jesus, and he says that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you. Speak the same thing. Paul's exhorting them again that they would come together in their thinking, having the same mind, okay? Agreeing with each other, having the same mind. And Paul says the same thing in, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2, where 
he tells the church in Philippi, For, fulfill my joy by being like-minded. And he, ex- he breaks down a little bit about what it is to be like-minded. Having the same love and being of one accord of one mind. And he'll go on talking about let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but, but that's the idea of having the same mind. And, and if we do take a little bit more of what Paul says in Philippians 2, we are going to s- consider the fact that, that we are supposed to consider others, even as we consider ourselves, but consider others even more so. Think about them. Think about who they are. I mean, that was the attitude of Christ. Paul will begin to explain that in Philippians chapter 2, that that was the mind of Christ. So he's saying, put on the mind of Christ. Have that, speak the same thing. You know, have that same mind. And, And what Paul's wanting is he's wanting to see, he's wanting them to see how dangerous their current behavior is. It's a dangerous behavior to have those divisions. It's dangerous, right? I think for many of us who have experienced divisions in the church where it causes church splits, we know how dangerous it is because people get hurt, especially young believers. They get hurt. And more than likely, usually what results in it is they turn away from the Lord because they look at an example of the mature believers, right, who are acting immaturely, and they want nothing to do with it. They want nothing to do with it. And so Paul's saying, look, speak the same mind and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul's saying, look, stick together, be joined together, be of the same mind, be of the same purpose. That's the whole idea of in the same judgment. The word there means in thought and purpose. Be the same in thought and purpose. Have the same purpose in mind to fulfill the will and purpose of God in the life of you as an individual and also in the life of the church that we're joined together. By the way, to be perfectly joined together, that word there is is in the Greek, the same word that's used in Mark chapter 1, verse 19. I find this interesting. This is fascinating. In Mark chapter 1, verse 19, Jesus is beginning to call his disciples. And when he goes down to the Sea of Galilee, he sees James and John. He sees the two brothers, the sons of Zebedee, and he says they're mending their nets. They're mending their nets. Why were they mending their nets? Because there were holes in their nets, right? And, And fish would escape. So they were there mending their nets so that it was joined together so that it can fulfill its purpose in catching fish and not letting them go. And I, when I saw that, I'm just like, wow, this is awesome. This is awesome because, again, being perfectly joined together, okay? And, and when we're joined together, if we look at the mending of the nets, they're repairing and, and they're making the net whole. Be fit together. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, as he's, uh, I'll go back to 15, but speaking the truth in love that we may grow up in all things unto him who is the head, Christ, again, Paul's preeminence in his mind is Christ, right? He's putting Christ first, from whom the whole body, who's the body? We're the body. Notice he says, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And as some would put, mic drop. 
boom, right? I get every, you know, knit together by what every joint's, okay, the mending the nets, but I kind of, exa- I. You ever see, you ever see people, how they put up drywall, right? One piece here, one piece there, one piece there, all individual pieces, right? And then they start joining it together. They mud, they tape, and then they smooth it out. By the time they're done, you would never know that there were several pieces put together. You're just seeing it all as one. And Paul will go on and even talk about one body, but what? Many members, right? Many members, one body. Folks, Paul is saying, look, as a church, we need to come together as one. And he's letting them know this, having that same thought and purpose in mind to accomplish the perfect will of God. Now, look at verse 11. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. So the word came to Paul while in Ephesus that there were problems at Corinth, and and they were brought to him by those of Chloe's household, okay? They were, they happened to be going to Ephesus, maybe for trade, maybe maybe to buy stuff, but they came across Paul and they they told him, Paul, there's problems, there's contentions, and Paul brings it up to them. Yeah, contentions among you. Contentions are, are quarrels and strife, you know? Wait a minute, churches don't have that, right? Quarrels and strife. We're God's people, we don't have that. I don't have that in my home, right? You don't have that in your home. You don't have that at the workplace. You don't have that in your life, quarrels. And yeah, I mean, the enemy's always trying to get us to have those quarrels and those contentions that strife because it'll cause disunity. It'll cause split. And and the enemy was coming in. And he was coming into the way of, of verse 12. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, Apollos, Cephas, Christ, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So, so I'm a Paul. Well, why would they say I'm a Paul? Well, Paul founded the church, right? He founded the church at Corinth. So we're, we're a Paul. Paul was the founder, so we're going to follow him. Well, no, we're not a Paul. We're of Apollos because Paulos was eloquent in the scriptures. He was a great orator and, and, and very knowledgeable. Of the word, and so we're going to follow him. No, no, but but you don't get it. What about what about Cephas? Cephas is the one that Jesus said, I, "I give you the keys of the kingdom." You know, you're you're the first of amongst the the apostles. So we're gonna follow, we're gonna follow Peter. You get the idea. They had all their different reasons why they should follow these men, and they were all wrong. And so now here comes the super spiritual ones that say, "We don't follow man." I'm of Christ. And, and that's true, we're to follow Christ, but God has given leadership of men and, and in women areas of leadership to lead women and men. There's those areas of leadership, and, and yes, we respect those people, and as Paul said, Imitate me as I imitate Christ, but he would often say, follow my faith, right? It's a good thing to have an example of a godly man that we can follow their faith, especially when we're young in the Lord. That's why we refer to them as mentors. Timothy, Paul was Timothy's mentor, right? And he helped him to build up in his faith. So the the ones who were saying, well, we're more spiritual because we follow Christ. We don't follow man. Now, I got, a, I got a story for you because Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Um, I read this from one commentary, but I thought it was a good one, and I'm sure he didn't come up with it. He probably heard it from somebody else. But it goes like this. There was an old contentious Quaker who went from one church to another, never finding the true church. And one day someone said to him, well, what church are you in now? 
And he said, I am in the true church at last. He goes, how many belong to it? Well, it's just my wife and I. And I'm not sure about her sometimes. <laughs> and J. Vernon McGee used to say that. Hey, if you ever found the right church, you just messed it up by getting there, by being there. Is Christ divided? That's a rhetorical question. The answer is, no, of course not. Was Paul crucified for you? Of course not. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. And then he says, verse 14, but I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had been baptized in my own name. You know, Paul's saying, you get away from looking to man. Yes, we look to Christ, but there's a place for man in the kingdom as we do the work of God. But he says, boy, I'm just, I'm just glad. And then he remembers, uh, yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus or Stephanus. Um, and besides, I do not know whether I baptize any other. So Paul's saying, like, I'm glad I didn't. What would that have done for you? Of course, we're the Great Commission, you know. We go out and preach the gospel and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Right? We know that, right? Acts chapter 9. We know that he was called to preach the gospel. He said, he did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He's talking about priority. The priority is to preach the gospel, and yes, more than likely, he did baptize some, but his focus was preaching the gospel. And he says, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. So he says, not with clever speech, lest the, the gospel the cross of Christ should be made of no effect or, or lose its power. I remember years ago, years ago when the church was first being established, uh, all the Branch Calvary Chapel may have been 96, 97, and there was uh, one of the guys who was in leadership, and he tried to be very clever in giving an Easter, uh, reser uh, let me see, it was, uh, yeah, uh, Easter message, uh, and he, he was looking at the trials of Jesus, and he actually tried to present it as a true trial. I mean, it was, it was pretty disastrous. It's like he, he tried to use wisdom of words, clever speech, and most of the people were lost. And what happened is there's no power in the message it there's no power in the message of the cross people were just like wow and so i think if we the point is you know we don't need to be clever about the cross right i mean what did paul tell him in verse five that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge um jesus told the disciples that when the, that time comes that you have to say anything that the Holy Spirit will give you that very thing to say. And so we trust God, we trust the Holy Spirit to give us what we need to say when we need to say it, but be ready always to share it, right? And don't complicate it where the, the, the cross, the gospel loses its power, all right? I think we can sometimes just overcomplicate it. Just needs to be, I, J. Vernon McGee, you know, take the cookie jar and bring it down where everybody can get their hand in it, right? Bring it down to the level where everybody can put their hand in it and receive a cookie, yeah? Some people will come, they won't, they'll just keep sticking their hand in it because it's so good. They'll come back for more. But, but keep it, you know, we, we keep it simple, right? The simple gospel. And Paul says, so that, that's my purpose of sending 
um, being sent to preach the gospel. And so he's, he's clarifying here and keeping them straight, but then he comes into the true message of the cross, and we'll get to that next week. But you can get an idea of what was going on in the church. Um, it was always, it, it ended up me, myself, and I, and what I think, and what I believe, and what I, and, you know, and that's really sad because um, since then, I mean, look at all the denominations, look at all the breakoffs, look at all the, you know, um, you know, the, the Baptist Church of First Street, the Baptist Church of Second Street, the Baptist Church of Third Street, you know, you get have going down the line. But you get the idea of just how, how denominations or churches have just gone their separate way because their focus has not really been Christ. If you've ever experienced a church split and you really take a look at it and why it happened, I'll tell you the focus was not Jesus Christ. If the focus was Christ, there may have been some, some rough things going on, but if the focus is Christ, it, we're going to work through those things and we're going to stay together. Because that's what Paul is telling them. We're going to work through this and we're going to stay together. Amen? It's all about Him. Father, we praise You. We give You thanks and all the glory. Father, um, as we consider divisions, if there's things happening in our lives personally, that the enemy is trying to divide our heart between you and other things, we know we need to put Christ first. Um, if there's division being caused in the home, we pray, Father, that you would um, speak to our hearts and, and remind us of, of who we are in Christ and that we would get past those things and come together as one. Uh, Father, in the church, if we pray that there is complete unity and oneness, not only here in Olive Branch, but in all the churches across the world, that, Lord, we as, as human beings would, would keep the focus on you, Lord Jesus, and the work that you have accomplished in our lives and the purpose that you have given us as your children, as followers, to keep our mind set on you, having the same mind, the same thought, and the same purpose for your glory and for your praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Jesus. 
we thank you again, Lord, that you've, uh, you've presented us to us, Lord, to be mindful of schisms, divisions, cliques, parties, different segments in the church that can, that can just rise up and begin to cause division in the church. And Father, we pray that we would always be mindful to be of the same mind to have the same purpose and the goal to accomplish your perfect will in our lives personally but also in the church as one having that unity of the body of christ for the bond of peace lord the bond of peace how wonderful that is but father always for your glory and always for your praise so lord continue to check our hearts um, for those things that can rise up personally in our own lives, in our homes, and also within the church. We thank you and we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. Let's worship and um, have fellowship. Amen.